This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. G'day, everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode, which features a chat with Rider Size from Nashville Pussy. The compelling event for the conversation is due to an Australian tour occurring in December 2022 by the group Eagerly Anticipated, and you can hear me bust her chops up top about not coming up to Brisbane. She receives it in good humour though. She receives, she's got a great sense of humour, I've got to say, in this chat here. It'd be easier for me to talk about the things that we don't mention. This is one of those expansive conversations that just goes wherever it goes. So I'm gonna leave most of the content as a surprise for you. Uh, Something I must mention though, is the internet connection was absolutely potato though. So you will hear it drop out and reconnect and you know, the garbled, you know, the bits of garbled conversation that come through. I've just left it all intact though, because, you know, it's too hard to do heavy editing on that sort of stuff and still for it to be, you know, it doesn't make it more coherent, put it that way. Now I have selected a tune for your listening pleasure. I went to Spotify, found what I believe is the most downloaded or streamed track by the group, Nashville Pussy. This one's titled, Come On, Come On. It's lifted from an album titled 10 Years of pussy we'll play that once it's done you'll hear the conversation of course you people on youtube you know the drill i can't play music so we're going to dive into the chat right now either way let's go here she is how are you i'm swell how the fuck are you <laughs> i tell you a bl- bl- bloody zoom i tell you what I'd, I'd give it a bit of a fisty cuff these days uh, it's they've changed their algorithm now so i used to use this common link and it worked for years, and now they've switched it up in the last few weeks, and it's causing all sorts of havoc. So I'm glad we can finally catch up regardless. Yeah, and I totally fucked up yesterday, so that was that was all me. That one's, that one's no algorithm. That's uh, that's my rhythm. <laughs> no, that's all good. How, how you been otherwise? You're getting ready for this tour, aren't you? Yeah, getting geared up. I'm starting to feel the... Uh, the uh, you know it's getting fucking it's getting exciting so is, it's is, been real it's been the calm before the storm prior to now but now now that we've done a shit ton of fucking interviews it's like it's real it's like yeah it's all happening I was going to ask you that I mean you guys have been doing it as long as anybody is it still exciting the whole idea yeah. of going across the world and playing to people you don't know this sort of thing you know it's not until you fucking do it. It's like the fact that we've done it before is just kind of like, uh, we can be a little blase about it. But then as soon as you step off the plane, actually pretty much as soon as you get on the plane, it's like, oh yeah, it's like, this is, <laughs> this is going to be great. Like I'm getting excited. It's up until now, I've just been kind of like, like, oh God, 22 hour fucking plane trip and four years in the making. Like, you know, I just want to get it over with, but now I'm starting to get excited. Now people are saying, oh, what's it going to be like there? And I start reliving old times and telling, describing kangaroos. People are like, oh, and then now I'm getting, now I'm getting excited. So yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm, yeah getting- I'm, I'm sure you've been hit up about this before, but is there a reason why you couldn't come to Brisbane and Perth? Man, it's uh, evidently it's because the, the city is booked. Like oh. that's I mean, Perth is Perth has always been difficult just because the distance mm. and uh, I guess I guess I don't know if there's enough of a I don't know if we have enough of a crowd there. We've never played there, so we have no idea. So there was originally on the on the schedule, and we we're so excited because obviously we want to go there and to see it off was a massive disappointment. And I mean, we, we were begging for Brisbane, Brisbane, Adelaide, Perth, Brisbane, especially for, you know, since we've been renegotiating all these, all these gigs and like, yeah, it's, we're very disappointed. And boy, do ever, we ever see it on fucking Facebook. <laughs> so everyone yeah. was like, what happened to Brisbane? Look, we a Queensland. We have friends is a, there. So it's yeah. I mean, you guys are custom built for Queensland, which is the state that Brisbane's in. Mm. And and to not play is, um, I mean, there's a cool and get a hotel. I, I mean, there, there's got to be a reason. I get it, but you know, it's just disappointing to be honest. Because I can't I see. Mean, it. I heard that. I heard that because 
because so many bands are just coming back all at the same time that there's massive competition and all the clubs are full. But, but okay. honestly, if there's enough of a, maybe there's enough of a, a groundswell amongst the people, maybe we can have our flight changed and we can have another fucking show. <laughs> yeah. We'll see what we can do. I'll certainly think I would do it. I would do it. Yeah, I mean, who knows? I don't know. These things are fairly locked in, aren't they, just because you're traveling so far. But, look, I'll certainly give the feedback, especially if you've been hit up online. The fans are saying that they want you to come up. Yeah. You know? Fuck yeah, I know. It's just like it's it's that's the thing I hear the most. I mean, it's equal parts yay to why aren't you coming to Brisbane? <laughs> it's fucking <laughs> holy shit, man. Really? 50-50? Fuck. We've had, we've had some very good times in that. I would least. imagine. Yeah, I would imagine we that had, would be the case. We had a really good week. We, we had a, a fantastic weekend in about 10 hours there one time. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> or spent, spent a month there one day. <laughs> yeah. Hey, r- random thought. I've just thought of this question now, but ha- have you and Phil Anselmo ever sort of connected and thought about doing a bit of a tour? We've never. We've uh, We've connected. We know each other, but we have never discussed that. No, oh, is wow. this a, is this something we should do? Oh, I think Let so. No, in, in in the illegals, yeah, with his illegals set up though, because that's he plays some Pantera stuff and that, but he's got some pretty gnarly stuff and that. And I saw, you know, I, I don't know Phil, but I've spoken to him in the course of doing this and. Um, saw him at the back room, which is a suburban venue here, and I was just thinking, you guys together as a one-two punch in that venue, if that could ever happen in the future, man, oh, wow, that would repay all the people who can't see you this time around, you know that? Just planting the seed. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll plant, the, plant a bug in his ear, man. Our, uh, our cousin actually works for him and is his right-hand man. He had um, – our cousin is an electronics – genius he Mm. was our guitar tech for many years and he got stolen away i got stolen away by a bunch of people got you know got paid a lot more than we could pay him but recently he was hired to take care of phil's halloween halloween display he has all these animatronic monsters and shit in his yard and cousin adam was the one who had to go down there and tweak them all (laughs) he had to go down there and make sure that they all you know fucking moved scared it was fucking funny man because he was supposed to come see our show adam you coming to our show he's like i gotta go to phil's and fix his monsters (laughs) (laughs) yeah he's right into that isn't he yeah definitely yeah he's very into yeah, I mean, look, but that that just hints at something that that you've, gosh, you've got all of these connections all over the world, not just you know, not just Phil, but all over the world. You you know all these people, and you were writing about it in a blog, and up until two thousand and fifteen, you were sharing these sorts of stories. So, are you planning to return to the blog? I don't know, man. Maybe I don't know. There's so many different venues of expression now. Mostly, I just talk shit on Facebook. You know, that's like kind of my venting. Because back then it was like there wasn't, we didn't, nobody communicated on, it was MySpace, you know, it was like nobody communicated on Facebook. And now it's like, maybe I should, I don't know. Maybe I've got more perspective now and I can do it again. That's cool that you saw it though, my rambling with Ryder. Yeah, I used to read it. Yeah, I like like keeping up with what you were talking about, but it it hints at something even bigger, which is that I think you need to write a book. Oh, Jesus Christ. Holy shit. Wow. Okay, now you're really <laughs> kissing my ass. Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'm not trying, believe me. I just think you let it. I just think you're one of those people out there that's a character and you've got a story to tell. If I get the right, you know, when I have the right person, like who wants to hear it, I can, I can spin a fucking yarn, you know? Mm. Spin a yarn. I love <laughs> it. That's yeah, what we got- say. Yeah. Uh, I have to be in the right perspective, but it might only take like a shot of whiskey and then fucking Mark Twain. <laughs> mm. And and the the only thing I'd ask you to do, make it as not safe for work as possible. Like just don't tone anything down. Just give us it all. You know, make Motley Cruz the dirt look like a fucking lullaby, a fairy tale. Yeah, those guys are a bunch of pussies. <laughs> that they are. Yeah, I know. I don't disagree with you on that point there. Yeah. Have you crossed paths with them very much over the years? Fuck no, man. I don't know shit about those guys other than what I see on TV. You know, it's like, I, um, the closest 
connection we have from them is that we were both signed by the same guy. Like Tom Zuto oh. is the one who signed them and signed us. Oh, wow. And, uh, and so we were, he was like the golden boy. He would sign, he sold Motley Crue, Roses, uh, I don't know, Nashville Pussy, right? And like, so for everything he touched for a little while, it turned to gold. And uh, he was even in the movie. He was in The Dirt. He was played by that actor who's banging Kim Kardashian now. I can't remember his name. Oh, Pete yeah. Something. Pete, Pete Davis. Davis. That Pete guy. Davidson, yeah. yeah. So Tom, Tom was played by that dude. And I mean, it was, you know, it was fun to watch him on the show, but we've never, yeah, I don't think we've ever had any. I'm not a Motley Crue fan. So if not made a point to maybe they, maybe we have cross paths, but I wouldn't go out of my way for it. Like, I don't think oh, I would cross can. the street. <laughs> to me. Yeah. I look, I've done, I'm, I'm with you. I've done almost 700 of these interviews and I don't think I'd want to speak to Nikki, Tommy or Vince. I just don't think it'd be that interesting. We do have an interesting there's that um our current drummer dusty watson is uh he used to play with lita ford back in the 80s and he came home one day to find his girlfriend lita blowing nikki six in their living room so that's kind of like knowing him <laughs> jesus christ yeah definitely yeah nikki's a weird I think guy they had work. i think they had Oh, really? Yeah. Dusty tells some stories, man. Yeah. I don't know if that's safe for work. <laughs> oh, well, you know, almost. God, can, can, <laughs> oh, look, I just think they're, they're, they self-promote far too much, and God knows if they've kicked out um, Mick Mars or whether he's left at his own accord. I mean, you just don't know. They just seem to be about – when it becomes about just purely about money, which is which it clearly is with those guys, I mean, they haven't – their new yeah. their new material was fucking terrible anyway. But – Yeah, I've never – yeah. Yeah. I, I can I'm, see the charm with the older stuff. You know what I mean? You can see – I really enjoyed The Dirt. I thought The Dirt was fucking hilarious. But I think I liked it because I don't give a shit about – the band at all it was just like comic it was just comic you know antics on the road it was funny i thought the whole thing was funny and that was it but the friends the people i do know who like motley crew didn't like that movie they were like it didn't do him justice and i was like you know i think it helped if you didn't care about him yeah i think you're right <laughs> I it was funny. Yeah. what's what what would you say is the biggest misconception about you guys as about nashville pussy I guess maybe that we are crazy hardcore partiers and probably people think that we're speed freaks and alcoholics and stuff like that. Maybe, mm. or maybe that we're, uh, that our lyrics are stupid. <laughs> these are, these are really? misconceptions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I mean, like if you don't know us and you've never seen us, there's another thing. Yeah. I guess if you've never seen us, you might think that we're, um, we're exploitative, but we're actually more like, um, I think more like Pam Greer as far as being like empowered. Like we, like, I think people might maybe have that misconception that we're, that our sexuality is forefront is what we're here all about. But really we're just like the spirit of rock and roll. And we happen to have a couple chicks in the band also. Mm. It's like, I don't know. Does that make sense? It makes complete sense. I mean, you There's can tell. Of- well, you can tell I'm a muser. You can't play drunk. We know that it just doesn't happen. It's fun at the time, at times, for occasions, but as soon as you get sort of overly tipsy, it does yes. just all falls apart, as you well know. Yes, yes, we've lost band members to their inability to be able to handle their. You know, if there's anything we learned from fucking Motorhead, it's how to party and how to rock, how to do both and how to not let one get in the way, interfere with the other and how to do them equally, you know, with equal enthusiasm. Like I tell I, I've said out loud before that, you know, Lemmy taught us how to do drugs. Mm. And that's like, you know, the short version of it. But really, honestly, those guys, they fucking they put us through the tests like 
And they would make fun of us if we were hung over the next day. And they would point and laugh if we had a hangover or if we were having any problem fucking playing. And we'd be saying, well, it's your fault because you gave me that. And it's like, no, it's your fault because you said yes. And it was like, oh, they're teaching us a fucking lesson, motherfuckers. Like they really did. They taught us it taught us how to party as hard as we play and be responsible for your own fucking actions. <laughs> it was a strange thing that we learned from Motorhead, but we did, you know, because they would try and they would, you know, have another shot, have another shot, have another shot, have a line, have another shot, have another line, have another line. And you want to try this, try that. Like, and you're just an idiot. You're just going, yes, 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 yes. And then the next day you're like fucking dead. And then they laugh at you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah. Were, were you close to Lemmy or Phil? We were. We are. We are. We are still close with uh, with both. You know, Lemmy was uh, Lemmy and Blaine used to text quite often about music more than anything. Um, they would they would send each other songs and stuff. And, you know, it's still kind of hard hard to swallow that we can't text the guy anymore and then uh phil of course has his own new his own new life that he's doing with his kids which is great but uh him and i used to be really close we spent a lot of time together like we're, just, we're cut from the same cloth like uh the world, world that owns tap shoes is phil campbell <laughs> me and him <laughs> Because we're both we're we're both prone prone to be very fucking annoying <laughs> when given the opportunity. <laughs> he br- he'd bring his cap, cap shoes on tour, and I've been threatening to bring mine. <laughs> nice, that's lovely. That I could see you guys occupy the same when I say spiritual trajectory. You know what I'm saying? You're connected to the same life force. Yeah. And I hadn't, I didn't know that until we went on tour together. Like I always hoped that we had that affinity with someone as amazing as Motorhead, whom I've loved since high school. But when I was, when I was in college, I wrote for a, for my university paper and I wrote a really disparaging article about Phil and I was actually read it. I've came across it just the other day and I was like, man, I was a little fucking bitch. Like, cause all, all I was doing was, reiterating what everyone else was saying at the time, which was like, oh, we love Fast Eddie Clark yep. and Wurzel's the rocker and Phil is just why we don't even know what Phil's there for. You know, it was this, it was everything everybody was saying. And I just felt like when I, I mean, when I read, I didn't even read the whole thing. I was so embarrassed because I know I did it at the time. And I even admitted this to Phil. I was like, man, I wrote, wrote a really, sh-. when I was like, 20 and i feel really bad about it he's like ah nobody probably read it anyways and i was like well you're fucking right like nobody read it but i feel bad about having done it and you know i was definitely it wasn't even my own voice you know i was just copying what i'd heard other people say about him Mm. and i feel really bad about it (laughs) i feel terrible about it it was well written but you know people don't people don't nice I, i get the impression people underestimate you because you are an academic you have the qualifications to call yourself an academic. I do have my bachelor's and I did graduate. Um, come loudly, as I like to say, but <laughs> three colleges and the second from top score out of, out of, I don't know what it was, but and I was, and I was so, I cared so fucking much about it that I didn't even know until my mother received the diploma in the mail because I never went to any of my graduating ceremonies. I never went to any year end ceremonies. I just didn't give a shit about any of that shit. And when, yeah, graduation ceremony, I definitely did not go. And my, and I, they said, what do you want done with your diploma? And I said, mail it to my mother. And my mom's like, you graduated at the top of your class. And I was like, did I? Like, like I had no fucking clue. So Yay. And then I took that degree, promptly became a guitar player. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Do, do you get back home very much, back to Canada very often? Um, maybe once every two years we get through. Yeah. Maybe it's um, 
somewhat the rock and roll scene, just like almost everywhere in North America has shrunk, whereas it's grown in Europe. So, mm. you know, we go where we go, where we're, we're wanted basically, which is Europe. Like Europe is our, we could go yeah. twice a year if we wanted to, we could probably go three times if we wanted to like extensive tours. There's still plenty of places we haven't been and they just, yeah, there's, there's no end of the touring over there. Whereas Canada is more of a labor of love. You want to go go when the weather's good. I don't know. I don't know what else makes a good tour. Mm. Canada good, but it wasn't great. You know, it was like I love I love being there because it's my fucking country. But it's like the, I you know I miss the food, I miss the people, I miss the weather. But yeah, the rock and roll scene's not as good as it used to be for us, at least. Maybe mm. maybe there'll be a resurgence. I don't know. Yeah. Do, do you find is Great Britain, England, your biggest territory? No, fuck no, man. France. France is everything. Wow. France, is, we can play like 30 fucking shows in France. And in the UK, we can play uh, London. <laughs> what, what do you put that down to, the, the French connection, so to speak? But I think they're really comfortable with women in a position of power. I don't know. Like they're, they think they fought for it. We've been told this, that, you know, like, like you are the embodiment of what we worked so hard for in the sixties and the seventies. And they're just like, they just completely embrace and they don't, they're not blinded by any kind of like language or sexuality. They just, it's all, they just understand rock and roll for some reason. Maybe it's like they're uh Maybe it's like how they they were the first to like get the blues, you know, like as opposed to America was like being all weird about, you know, B.B. King or whoever, like, you know, mm. France or even France was even more into Americana when, yeah, when Americans don't dig American music, like France was like rolling out the red carpet for Miles Davis, and, you know, making him go in the back door here in the States, like, like they, I don't know, they have a really strong appreciation of American culture, which is like, you know, I have to explain that to my American friends that France is where it's at. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. You're the first person I've spoken to on that topic. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. They're the birth, birthplace of postmodern philosophy and they overthrew their monarchy hundreds of years ago. So yeah. there's that very flat, almost Marxist, or well, is a Marxist outlook. It's a socialist outlook that they've got. And I guess what you're talking about sort of gets wrapped up in it. Yeah. Well, I mean, the fact that we did have a, a press release for, or a press conference one time where the the commentator, the translator said that said essentially that we are the embodiment of what he fought for when he was in university and he was in his fifties at the time and we were probably in our thirties and and it was like you know you you are what we wanted to have happen and thank you like you know like you're you're our product basically and it was like okay then like i will take that like fantastic like they're like ahead of the curve in that way as far as like accepting women and accepting i'm just embracing sexuality like you know they've always been a little more you know, laissez-faire <laughs> menage <laughs> trois is french you know like yes. you don't say it anyway. <laughs> Yes. What's uh, Jean ne parle pas beaucoup de français? Do you speak a bit? Un peu. <laughs> Un petit peu seulement. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah, I usually remember it when I'm in Spain. And then when I leave Spain, I remember my Spanish. And then I remember my Italian when I get to Germany. And then it's like, hmm. yeah. Yeah. I can basically say, do you have a light in every every language? <laughs> <laughs> Where's the bar and do you have a light? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you've got, you guys have got six live albums and you've got eight studio albums. So surely the idea of recording a live album of all brand new tunes has been discussed. Um, You know, it hasn't. That'd be a good idea. <laughs> that'd, that'd work a for you live, guys. A live album of brand new songs. Precisely. Yes. Hmm. That's pretty interesting. I'm gonna write that down. Yeah. Live album. Friends. You guys are one of the few bands with the fortitude to pull that off, and it makes sense, I believe, for you guys. That's really interesting. I'm glad it resonates because yeah, there's very few bands that I believe could do that. You got to be a no bullshit rock and roll band. ACDC could do it. Motorhead could have done it. You guys, you're the three bands off the top of my head that would be able to to, to be you're that powerful that it would come across. 
that way we could save time in the studio too. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Ass idea. That's really interesting. Yeah, I've never even thought about that. That's like wild. <laughs> I mean, I wrote, it, I wrote it down. I put a big box around it. So. Thank you. Fingers, that's all right. No, fingers crossed it happens. Yeah, yeah. Fingers crossed that it all occurs. But uh, what, what about what about your take on music in general? Do you, do you feel like you guys started about twenty five or thirty years ago? I'm talking about when you broke. You know, when you became part of the popular in the popular lexicon of rock and roll fans. But do, do you think does it feel better now, or was it better back then? Well, obviously, at the time, we were a product of our time or fighting against it. And so, you know, it was really fun to be, uh, you know, the next big thing for a little while. That part's great. But um, I think we're actually coming into our own in a strange way in that, at least in America, I think the people are starting to catch up with where we where we have been on this. We just did this tour in October. And the amount of young women in the crowd and and just people who had never seen us before and were just fucking blown away. It was like we hadn't played. We've been playing mostly to our fans. This time we were playing in front of um, a band from the 90s called the Toadies. And they yeah. had really big house. You know, remember. like we were playing 100, 1500 people and they had never seen us before. And so every single night I met all these Nashville pussy virgins and they were like, holy fucking shit, you are fucking incredible. And then these little girls, like teenage girls, like some of the all ages shows and they were they'd be in the front row with this look on their face like, oh, my God, I can't believe you exist. And I understand every fucking thing you're doing. And they were just right with me every step of the way they were like they had no problem with with my shaking my fucking ass and they had no problem with me kicking some fucking dude in the face they were just like yeah you know like they they got it all they got the sexuality they got the fucking anger they got the joy they got the passion they just they were just right there with me it was like fucking mind meld and it was so cool to see all these um, young people like getting it and this i've and i've not seen that in the united states before so this this is kind of i feel almost like a like time is is on our side as far as that goes so that's that's exciting plus i mean like some of the music that's out these days is so fucking crazy that makes national like the the bar has been raised as far as like how crazy we can get with our lyrics like there's no limits <laughs> yeah but it wasn't like that back in the day was it i distinctly recall when let the meat pussy was released in australia it came with a silver wrapper around it okay so if you, okay. if you bought a yep. cd at a, did, did it i don't know is the right way of framing it bug you annoy you what have you that at the same time say gangster rap or urban music was all about street violence and overt street violence by the way but a woman couldn't demonstrate couldn't be out there with a sexuality at that time yeah it was just ridiculously hypocritical i was appalled by it and i mean honestly like whatever i don't know what the hell world i came from but to me like national pussy just sounded like a funny thing like it was a funny name and i never it just never even dawned on me that it wouldn't be on a marquee uh, anywhere. You know, of course it's going to be in Carnegie Hall. You know, like, uh, like of course they're going to say it at the Grammys. And like, what kind of fucking idiot wouldn't say it? It's just a fucking band name. It's funny, you know. And like, I had no idea that we were like, whatever. I guess we were destined to be in the future or something. <laughs> like, like we had to yeah. wait for people to catch up. You know, like I, it just seemed to me like this was normal. Like, you know. I think it did for a lot of Australian fans. So you, I mean, you you did catch on very quickly, Danny. You guys in the helicopters. I distinctly recall in that era. Remember that the late nineties, because rock and roll wasn't around back then. But you you two came through, and you really fucking cut through. You know, yeah. and that was the image and everything. It was about just going to a gig, drinking, having a joint afterwards, this sort of thing. And even I don't like Marilyn Manson, but I've got to give him credit. I remember the same era going to his concerts and it was like that, but it was all off the back of that fucking grunge shit, which was all too self-conscious, stare at the floor stuff. It was it was a great <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. No worries. Yeah, we've yeah, we got a couple of them. <laughs> All right. And we're back. All good. Do you um 
Do, do you follow politics at all? Does it interest you? Oh, God, no. I fucking hate it. I'm a, I'm, I'm, which uh, I think puts me in a great position because like, I'm not responsible for any of these jokers mm. whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with Lee when he said, don't vote. It only encourages them. Yeah, that's so true. In the States, it is. We, in Canada, is it like Australia, you've got the Westminster system, which means that you're forced to vote, aren't you? It's compulsory. You're not forced to vote. Oh, I don't in Canada. think you're forced to vote. Wow. Okay, so it's a, it's a elective, so to speak, elective election. There you go. I, I don't know. That's a good question. Are you forced to vote? What is it, the Westminster? Yeah, what do well, we call it? Yeah, Westminster system, which we have, you know, the the, the system of governance from, from the UK that we use in Australia and Canada because we the Canadian system and the Australian system is virtually the same. You know, got a constitution rather than a bill of rights. Minster. Westminster system. Yeah. That's a good question. I've only I've been able to vote one time in my life. Canada is a parliamentary democracy. It's a system the government holds the law. It's the Supreme Authority. Blah, blah, blah. It stems from the Westminster. Are there, is it compulsory to vote? It's interesting if it isn't, because it is for us, yeah. And it means people who wouldn't ordinarily become politicized do. But I can understand why we do have compulsory voting, given we've only got about 20, 22 million of us, and of that, there's only, you know, two less than, oh, I think it's something like half of the people are entitled to vote because of youth and people who come from overseas, that sort of thing. But then, so, so how do you, how do you, um, how do you bow out of an election by ruining your vote? Yeah, yeah, you can do donkey votes. Yeah, as long as you get your name ticked off at the electoral booth, you can basically draw dicks on the electoral ballot or whatever you want to do, which plenty of people do, by the way. But look, there these days there are, there are single issue parties. It's probably the same in the states and Canada, I suppose. But there yeah. are one of the biggest single issue parties. One of the ones that I really support is the uh, the mandate of uh, reducing uh, of removing the criminalisation of cannabis use of cannabis. Now, oh. I, I, I come at it from the medicinal perspective. You know, I've got Crohn's something mimicking Crohn's disease, and I can tell you how much it helps me in conjunction yeah. in conjunction in union with with traditional pharmaceuticals now but a lot of people like your average mum and dad and ma and pa kettle won't won't buy marijuana they just won't do it unless it comes from a dispensary i think we've got to yeah. remove those obstacles you know i mean that's i don't know why it's not a bigger issue anyway. it's happening um quite quickly in the united states and it's pretty impressive how mm. how like even just in blaine's family Blaine is from from Kentucky, and Kentucky has t has traditionally been one of the largest suppliers of hemp since America was founded, mm. and therefore also weed. And I do believe, I think it's just now, like in the last year, maybe they've made it. They've finally made it. Like uh, I don't even think it's legal. But it's no longer illegal. Yeah, it's decriminalized. Yeah, yeah. And they're one of the law. They're one of the last. Georgia is still, but there's there's still ways around it. It's like it's such a gray area right now. But it's like we've been waiting. Blaine pretty much almost always votes on no war and legalization of weed. Those are his. Those are his go tos. Those are his. Those are the, his mo his most important things, the ones that affect him the most in traveling around the world yeah. and traveling around America. And uh, he'll he'll definitely praise any any state that's finally come around. But there's a plenty plenty that haven't, like where we live in Georgia. It's not fully legal. It's not completely decriminalized. There's they can st they're still trying to figure out a way to like fine you if you're high. I think now yeah. for driving. But it's like yeah. It, it's and it's it was just embarrassing to see how long it took Kentucky to embrace the fact that not only historically have they been the supplier of America of this shit, but <laughs> that they could be making a lot of money off it because it's yeah. a really poor state and they could actually take advantage of this. But we've seen it, you know, in our time where Blaine's mom would be like, you know, you know, you're not smoking weed to like, how <laughs> like she's <not> like. <laughs> She's interested. 
you know, it's amazing. Like what? Like we can sit around and talk about edibles with our nieces and our mother. Like that's like, that's, we never thought yeah. this time would come. So thanks for finally voting it in. Like, yeah, no, it's been a hell of a, it's been, it's been quite a journey over the last 20 years. And look, you, you mentioned Blaine in there too. I, I've, got, I've got to ask, look, I've been married for 12 years and I've been with my wife for about 15 or so, but you guys are well into your third decade as in your partnership. So did, do you get asked a lot about what the secret to a lasting relationship is? <laughs> well, you know, there's nothing uh, that uh, don't go to bed angry. That's a real thing. Man. Yeah, that's agreed. really, yeah. that's a, that's a really good thing. Um, yeah, I don't know. Giving each other space, really good. His back is really good. Like, I don't know. Cause, cause not only that, we, uh, we take it to the road where it's like, yeah. you know, it's like life squared. It's exponential. The amount of time you said spend together once you put wheels underneath it, you know, and then stick it into a, a metal container with a bunch of other people. <laughs> but definitely, I don't know. We just, we encourage the shit out of each other. Like whatever each other's passions are, you know, I want, I want him to be happy. He wants me to be happy. We've always been that way with each other. We're really encouraging of, of each other, of each other's, you know, independence and all that. And I don't know, it works out really good. He's my, still my favorite person in the whole fucking world, you know? Mm. Like he's awesome. in Kentucky, right? He just left this morning to go to Kentucky to play with Nine Pan Hammer and shoot a video. And he comes home Sunday night, and then we fly out Monday morning to come see you guys. Oh God, busy, busy, busy. Yeah, never a dull moment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hey, man, he's he's got more motivation than I do. I want to stay home, <laughs> play with uh, the cat. <laughs> yeah, that's not a that's not a metaphor. <laughs> Yeah, what can we say? All right, look, I'll make this my last question for you, okay? And uh, I love asking people like you, people who have been in the business for this long, been a success, you've managed to do it. So many of us tribe and you've actually done it. But if you could go back and give yourself some advice when you first started, like, you know, when you when you were leaving Canada, coming to the US, you know, you met Blaine, some of the things that you didn't know back then that you don't, don't know you know, you know now, but you didn't know back then. What do you think you'd say to yourself? What advice would you give to yourself? Uh, well, I would definitely tell tell myself to accept that Gibson's size offered me in about ninety nine, and I said I wasn't ready yet. Well, yep. That, that was really stupid. My dad was like, "What? You said no." I was like, man, this is my first, we've got one record out. Like, I don't know if this is the guitar that I'm going to be playing with in two years. And he's like, you just take the guitar. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I said no to a signature model, which is like, what the fuck? Oh my gosh. So, yeah. yeah. No, shit happens. It's not like that's it's. That's one advice. Hmm. Well, that's a good bit of advice, that one right there. Yeah, that might be one of the best answers to that question I think I've ever got. <laughs> it's good. It's pretty specific. <laughs> no, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. Well, well look, good. Good luck with uh, the tour. I know it'll go well. You know, you, you love down here. Um, you got, you got, a, you got some very dedicated fans down here, as I'm sure you're aware. And uh, fingers crossed that that Brisbane thing comes off. But if it doesn't, just keep in mind the Phil thing, and um, ho hope that live album comes out too sometime. <laughs> Yeah, that's fucking brilliant, man. I've circled both those. That's fucking really cool. I appreciate that. I rarely get, you know, it coming this way. It's usually just me spouting my nonsense that way. So <laughs> that's very cool. And so you're in Britain. Are you coming down to for Frankie's last final fucking blowout show in Sydney? No, I, I'm I'm from Sydney originally, funnily enough. But no, I just with kids, I got kids and work and all the rest of it. I, I sometimes rare moments come to travel, yeah. but you are one. That is one show that I travel for. I just don't have the opportunity, unfortunately. And I think a, a lot of us are in the same boat. It's just our, you know, December is a silly season. It's hard to travel. Um, but no, I mean the fact that hey, that's really important, actually. So I'll make that point before we head off. But. I don't think any other band could have closed out that venue except for you guys. You know, maybe you you guys destroy 666 or something like that, but, you know, the fact that it's you guys is just perfect. That's fantastic. That's so cool. I mean, I have a feeling it's going to be like a tailgating party where everyone's going to 
going to be so trashed. By the time we hit the stage, they're going to be saying, you guys were great. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been a... They'll be like, oh, Brad, you're legends. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a bit of an institution, that place. I hope that they reopen and maybe franchise, not franchise, but, you know, they open in Brisbane or Gold Coast or something like that too. But the fact that it's you guys that are closing it out, man, I mean, it's going to be a fucking huge party. I mean, the hangovers are going to be legendary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why we actually asked for uh, we asked for a day off after that because we knew we knew it was a like it was like we have to play we do Fran- Frankie have our show and then we have a day off so it's gonna be uh, it should be we're gonna have a fucking massive hangover but that's what days off are for and <laughs> cuddling with that shit yeah indeed yeah well. Well, I'm sorry I'm going to miss it, but, you know, good luck. Uh, good luck for the show and um, look yeah, for the rest of the you know, career. Uh, yeah. Maybe we can rally the troops and uh, force a Brisbane show, you know. Yeah, I'll message John and say that you've gotten a lot of feedback on it too and maybe you'll pass it on because Hardline Media, I think, are bringing you guys down, isn't it? So, um, yeah. Yeah, 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 so the guys at Hardline, you know, just to say, hey, look, if it can be swung, it's not like there isn't the the willingness from within the band to sort of meet the fans. Oh, fuck yeah, man. We're God damn. Like it's, it's, I mean, I hate to say it, but it's like, I keep, I'm, you know, now that there's fucking social media and people can directly contact. I mean, I know I, I don't have to write back, but I've been saying like, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, we're trying, <laughs> we're trying, we're trying. Like, we asked so hard. Like we begged, please, is there a possibility? Like, can we possibly make, I mean, like, well, where can we, we'll play anywhere. Like, we don't care. Just add a fucking day. Like, you know, Brisbane has spoken. It's like, God damn. So if, if there's anything that can be done from that end, please, you know, I'll keep bugging them. They know we're open to it. Like we'll change our fucking tickets. Like we're perfectly willing to do it. Like, yeah, there's venues around. There's venues we on the Gold it, Coast. Believe yeah. yeah, I can see. I can tell. I mean, the only argument I have. Oh, you go. Yeah, I just keep telling people it's like we're, we are we are traveling forty times as far to come see you guys as you are if you come to the Sydney yeah. show. <laughs> it's like just bear in mind the perspective, pretend a little perspective here. <laughs> like we've come a long ways. So the least you can do is come down to Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> I, I totally understand that perspective too. Yeah, no, and you're quite right too. It's uh, it's just it, it, it comes back to you know bringing the conversation full circle. You guys are perfect for our neck of the woods. You know, even more so than in Sydney, which is a big city, as you you know, like a global city. But Brisbane, it's still a bit. Brisbane, Queensland's like Florida. You know, so it's got I know, that. man. That's, I don't. I I don't know if you heard, heard me tell the story before, but like. Years ago, me and Blaine wound up doing ketamine down in Florida with an old friend of his from high school. I mean, this was 20 fucking years ago. And we did Special K for the first time. And we were like, holy fucking shit, this drug is insane. And the next, we were like, hey, you got any more of that K? He's like, oh, we don't do K anymore. Now we do G. And it's like, oh, fuck, I really like that K. And then we had never played in Brisbane at that point. We've been told that Brisbane was 10 years behind the times. We get there, and what are they doing? Special K. <laughs> and it was like, oh my god, I remember this stuff from ten years ago. It was, and it was so fucking funny. I think Blaine and I, oh my, we just did like a little tiny bump, and I remember begging our band to go home. Like it's like it's too late. We've been here too long. We have to go back to the hotel. And so we went going back to the hotel, and we sober up because you sober up really fast from that shit. And we looked at the clocks, and it was like. It was like 11 p.m. Like, what the fuck do we do? So we went back to the bar. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I meant when I said we had a fucking, we spent a week there one night. It was weird. Me, we had a lot of fun. The old K-hole. Yes, yeah. we were in the K-hole. Yeah. <laughs> I remember I left the bar wearing a fucking Dixie Chicks shirt. <laughs> like somebody Jesus. gave me a Dixie shit shirt. It said something really funny on it. I can't changing shirts in the bar like ah, <laughs> uh, so much fun oh well hopefully it's repeated so but we've we never played brisbane again i've got <laughs> yes let's hope it's repeated <laughs> oh my god yeah i need a new dixie chick shirt yeah dixie chicks they got the chicks these days <laughs> well, aren't they? thank you man <laughs> my pleasure yeah, they're all they're down on dixie 
<laughs> cool. Well, if we don't see you this time, we'll see you next time. Absolutely. Been a pleasure. I've been looking forward to this one. All it's right. been great. God bless. No worries. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> Bye. You. See ya. Bye. What a lovely free spirit she is. Enjoy that conversation. All of the, I'm not going to call her a veteran because she's not old enough to be a veteran, but the point is the people that have been doing the rock and metal thing for decades, man, they are by far and away my favorite conversations and I hope you can tell. So that was a chat with Rider Size from Nashville Pussy. Now, my name's Andrew Mackay Smith and I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast. If you want to listen to even more conversations like that, go across to scarsandguitars.com Click on the podcast link and you'll be taken to a whole universe of conversations. If you like listening, perhaps you like reading, because I have written a book about the show titled Scars and Guitars, Volume 1, Conversations from the World of Heavy Metal and Beyond. Click the link in the banner on the website. You'll be taken to a marketplace of your choice. Download a sample and if you like it, please buy. And then hit me up because I want to thank you personally. I've got some more to share with you about the book, but before I do, I'm going to bid you a fond farewell. I've already done my signature. Should I do it again? Why not? My name's Andrew Mackay-Smith, and I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast. Until next time, it's a very goodbye for now. This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew Mackay-Smith. I've been the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast since 2017. The first musician I interviewed for the show was David Vincent from Morbid Angel and things have just snowballed from there. In all, I've posted almost 650 podcast episodes featuring conversations with many of the leading lights of rock, heavy metal and beyond. It just got to a point where I thought I need to write a book about all this, so that's exactly what I did. In Scars and Guitars Volume 1, you'll read a heap of deep reveals and commentary, such as Des Fafara talking about Cold Chamber and why the band will never return. You know, if you're a, a band just starting out, you need to hear me. Do not start a band with partners. Ever. Yeah, wise words there. Sage advice, mate, for anybody. Don't ever, because I, I can't go do Cold Chamber right now unless I get others involved. Phil Anselmo talks about the episode in his career, which gives him the greatest sense of accomplishment. I think the staying power of the, the fans and the staying power of the I, of the songs, you know, whether it's Pantera, Down, or Super Joint, the fans remember the songs. Alex Skolnick from Testament confirms that, yes, playing the guitar in Ozzy's band is anything but an ordinary gig. Will Silent Oz from Demu Borgir write a book? Pa from Sabaton gives advice to people who want to start a band. Look at the team around you, look at the bandmates. If, uh, if the guys want to be on the stage, then it's all cool. If the guys want to be backstage, then it's not going to be cool. Current and former members of Cradle of Filth discuss the band's seminal 90s material. Read about the reaction to George Lynch and Mark from Suicide Silence's comments when they throw shade at then President Donald Trump. We have this idiotic monster, you know, this egotistical, self-aggrandizing, complete piece of shit in there. I, I, I just I just can't understand how we've gotten to this place. And yeah, we kicked a hornet's nest with Sepultura. Percussive overlord Gene Hoagland talks about recording with Chuck Schuldina. Chuck was always, um, you know, he was, he was very, you know, very open-minded and, and he was into having his, his musicians that were playing with him just reach out for, for the best stuff that they had. Phil Campbell from Motorhead discusses what it takes to get sober. John Five answers his critics who dismiss his tenure with Marilyn Manson. You know, my name is John Five and Manson gave me that name and um, I had some of the best years of my life in that band and, and learned a lot. And we get the lowdown on Trey Zagtoth from those who would know, including his mother. All across Scars and Guitars Volume 1, there are moments of tension, relief, tragedy, exhilaration, and throughout it all, you'll obtain insight that I believe no one else has managed to obtain from many of your favorite artists. So treat yourself. Scars and Guitars Volume 1 is currently available as an ebook with a print edition on the horizon. Follow the links attached and download a sample 
I'm sure you'll be compelled to read the whole book.